we start with thoughts of goodwill to remind ourselves of why we want to meditate. We want to find a reliable happiness, and we want to find a happiness that doesn't harm anybody else. That's why we spread goodwill both to ourselves and to all beings. To remind ourselves that this is a special kind of happiness. And then when we're clear about why we're doing it, then we settle down to business. Here the business is watching your breath. Take a couple of good long, deep in and out breaths and notice where you feel the breathing in the body. You feel the passage of air through the nose, but you also feel the rise and fall of the chest, sometimes the rise and fall of the abdomen or of the shoulders. Notice where the feeling of breathing is most pronounced. And allow your attention to settle there and keep it there all the way through the in-breath and all the way through the out, and in the spaces between the breaths. And as you breathe in, notice if there's any unnecessary tension in that part of the body. Maybe that the breath is too long and that as you get toward the end of the breath it's beginning to feel uncomfortable. Well, allow the breath to grow shorter. Or if it's too short and you feel like you're not really getting the full energy of the breath, allow it to stretch out a bit. In other words, experiment with the breathing to see what feels best. If you find something that feels good, stick with it. And it may feel good for a long time, or it may feel good for just a little while, and then not so good anymore. So try changing it again. Try to keep on top of what the body needs. The purpose here is twofold. One, to get the mind to settle down into the present moment, and two, to be observant. Because the breath is one of the few bodily functions that you can actually change consciously. And so try to take advantage of that, both for the settling down and for the being observant. If the breath feels good, and if you find it's interesting to notice that the way you breathe has an impact on how the body feels, that helps you to stay in the present moment. And you start learning about what the breath is doing, and as you look at the breath, you're going to be able to look at the mind as well. Because ultimately the breath is not the problem. The real problem lies in the mind. We all want happiness, and yet we choose to do things that can often lead to pain for ourselves or for other people. So there's a disconnect. And the question is, where is the disconnect? Sometimes it's because we don't have a very clear knowledge of what our intentions are, or maybe because we don't really see the connection between our actions and their results. So starting with the breath, notice what your intention is. You're here for the sake of happiness. You're here to learn to train the mind so it doesn't create a lot of problems. And of course, not every part of the mind is going to be cooperative. Some parts are going to wander away, have other agendas. So for the time being, you just let them go. In other words, you don't have to get entangled with them. Just notice there is that other thought, but you don't have to follow it. That right there is an important insight. You don't have to run after everything that comes up in the mind. And then stick with the breath as long as you can. And see what impact it has on the mind and has on the body. This is the part of the practice that requires some conviction. It's like making scrambled eggs. The right way to make scrambled eggs is to keep the heat really low. And so you sit there and you stir the eggs in the pan and nothing seems to be happening. 
and there's a very strong temptation to turn up the heat. But you have to resist that temptation. Just keep on stirring and stirring and stirring, and after a while you find the eggs really do begin to coagulate on the bottom of the pan. And it's in that period when you don't see results that are coming yet. That's when you have to have conviction that the cookbook was right. And it's the same with the meditation. There are times when you sit and meditate and nothing much seems to be happening. And so you need the conviction to stick with it. This is why we have the chance on the Buddha and the Dharma and the Sangha to remind ourselves that this path we're following here is not a brand new path. It's not something which just recently cooked up. In fact, the Buddha himself said he didn't invent the path, he discovered an old path. There had been Buddhas before him, awakened people before him, and this is the path they all discovered. We have all the Buddha's enlightened disciples as guaranteed that, yes, this path does work. So you just stick with it. Part of the mind will complain, because of course there still is greed, aversion, and delusion in the mind. It's not the fact that you sit down and close your eyes and they all go away. They hide out for a while, but they're going to come up again. And they're going to complain, well, they'd rather do this, I'd rather do that. And you just remind yourself, you've been following greed, aversion, and delusion for who knows how long. And they do provide some pleasure, but there's usually a lot of pain that goes along with that pleasure. How about trying something new? New for you, at least. Something different. And so you just stick with it, stick with it, stick with it. As the Buddha said, it's patient endurance that makes a huge difference. Burns away a lot of the issues in the mind. It doesn't solve all the problems. The ultimate problems are the ones that are going to require discernment. That's what you develop as you practice. So in the beginning you take whatever cruder skills you have at your disposal. The conviction and the patience, your stick to a tividness. Now that can get very old very quickly if you don't have something of interest, and that's why we put an emphasis on working with the breath. When the breath gets comfortable, the next step is to think of that sense of comfortable breath spreading through different parts of the body. When we talk of breath here, it's not air coming in and out. It's the movement of energy in the body, because that's what gets the air to come in and out to begin with. Without that energy, nothing would come in and out at all. And so notice, when you breathe in, where do you feel the energy flow in the body? If you're really sensitive, you find that it goes throughout every nerve in your body, from the top of the head down to the feet down the shoulders, down the arms, all through the torso, all through the head, all around. There's even an energy that surrounds the body. And so to try to make yourself as sensitive as possible to the energy that's happening right here. It says, with any task that takes time. If you have something to entertain yourself that helps you stick with the task. And here the entertainment is actually part of the work. We talk about playing with the breath, and we also talk about working with the breath. The playing with it emphasizes the fact that it can be fun. You start noticing that there are spots, say, in your spine where there's a lot of tension. But if you consciously relax the tension, there's a sense of flow that goes through. It feels a lot better. And you may find that releasing one spot of tension in the body has a chain reaction effect. Other areas of tension in the body begin to relax as well. You notice the way you hold your body might change. And with a 
flow of the breath energy in the body improved, it's going to be good for your health. This is medicine that doesn't cost anything at all. And as for the work part, well, you're trying to spread your awareness to fill the whole body. So eventually you can be aware of the whole body all the time, through the in-breath, all the time, through the out. And that broadens the range of your awareness. And you begin to see things happening in the mind that you didn't see before. They were hidden in a blind spot because the range of your awareness is very narrow. But as we allow it to broaden out, See, begin to see little bits and snatches of thoughts here and there. And you can catch sight of the mind's decisions. Usually there are several conversations going on at once in an ordinary mind. You may be paying attention to one or two, but there are others going on as well. And you, you every now and then slip in and add a little something and then slip right out. And then you can deny to yourself that you did any of that slipping around at all. This is one of the reasons why we don't see the connection between our actions and the suffering we cause. There's a fair amount of denial going on in the mind. But when your range of awareness is all around like this, it's harder to maintain that denial. And it's better. You begin to see what's going on, and some unskillful thoughts in the mind can hang on simply because you're not paying attention to them. But when you see them clearly, it's very easy to let them go. Now there are others that are going to require more work, what the Buddha calls exerting a fabrication, or fabricating an exertion. He uses both phrases. What this means is there is some conscious work that you have to do in order to understand why you're stuck on this particular kind of action or kind of thinking, and what you can do to give an alternative, provide the mind with an alternative. And it turns out the way you breathe is very intimately connected with all of this. It's called bodily fabrication. As I said, it's one of the few functions in the body that you can intentionally change. So you work with that. Say anger comes up in the mind. One of the first things you can do about it is notice okay, where in the body is there the tension that goes along with the anger. And then try to breathe through it. Think of the breath energy just dissolving that tension away allowing it to dissipate out in the air so you don't have to be carrying it around or you don't feel burdened with the need to get it out in your words or your deeds. And as you're working with the breath, you also become sensitive to two other kinds of fabrication the Buddha talked about. One he calls verbal fabrication, which is the, the way the mind talks to itself. It directs its thoughts to a particular topic and then it starts evaluating it and deciding what it likes and what it doesn't like and what it wants to do and doesn't want to do. And when you're working with the breath, you'll be engaging in just that kind of verbal fabrication. You become more conscious of it and realize that you can change the way you talk to yourself about things, especially when you start getting new perspectives about what's going on in the present moment, what's going on in the mind, what's going on in the body. And then there's finally what the Buddha calls mental fabrication, which are perceptions, the labels we apply to things, and then feelings, feelings of pleasure, pain, or neither pleasure nor pain. And again, as you're working with the breath, you find that you're holding a particular perception of the breath and mind. If you think of the breath simply as the air coming in and out of the nose, that influences one way that you're going to breathe. But if you think about the energy in the body as being the breath, and it can go anywhere in the nervous system, that gives you another perception. It's going to change the way you actually experience the breath. Then you can start thinking of all those little tiny nerve endings go all the way out to the pores of your skin. They've got breath energy too. If you hold that perception in mind, how does that change the way you breathe? How does it change the way you feel in the present moment? So you're getting some conscious experience and learning how to manipulate what the Buddha calls bodily fabrication, verbal fabrication, and mental fabrication. To 
create a sense of ease within the mind. And then you can use those same fabrications to deal with whatever else comes up in the mind. For the time being, you want to, don't want to get too involved in any distracting thoughts. But after a while, as you get good with these types of fabrication and you feel solid in the present moment, you can turn and look at whatever the thought was that seemed to be so attractive. And you can start analyzing this way. When that thought comes in the mind, how do you breathe? What things are you saying to yourself that give rise, say, to greed or aversion or delusion? What are the perceptions that are lying behind these thoughts, the labels that you apply to things? And what kind of feelings surround all this? Can you change those things? Fabricate something different so that when an incident comes up in your life that you would normally react to with anger, can you refabricate your reaction? Something that would give rise to lust, can you refabricate that? So the aversion or the anger or the lust don't hold any appeal. Now part of this is because there is a greater sense of well-being when you work with the breath, play with the breath. So the mind's sense of hunger, just wanting some, wanting some action, wanting something entertaining, has less of an edge. And it's partly because you see that the way you react is optional and it's causing stress that doesn't need to be there. It's that combination of seeing that it's optional, that you're creating an awful lot to the situation just by the way you're looking at it. And if it's causing stress, well, why not look at it in a different way? Why not breathe around it in a different way, perceive it in a different way, evaluate it in a different way? These are some of the lessons you can learn by working and playing with a breath like this, allowing the mind to become more firmly settled in the present and to see things a lot more clearly, and to understand this process of how you fabricate your experience. This is one of the Buddha's major insights. There's an analysis of suffering and stress. It's called Dependent Core Rising. It talks about all the different factors that give rise to stress and suffering. And half of them come even before sensory contact, even before you see something or hear something. The mind is already primed to create suffering out of it, if it's operating under the power of ignorance. So what we're doing here is learning how to bring knowledge to those processes, so we're no longer priming ourselves for suffering and stress. We're priming ourselves to put an end to it. which is in line with our original intention. We want to be able to see why it is that the actions we do for happiness lead to stress and how we can change those ways so we can actually act in the way that leads to true happiness. We break things down into very simple components so we can manage them. We realize it is a problem we can manage. That's the good news of the Buddha's teachings. That even though we may be causing ourselves stress and suffering, it's good to know that because it means that we can put an end to it. If, we're, if our suffering really was caused by things outside that were beyond our power, that, that there'd be no hope. Or if it was caused by things we're doing that we couldn't change, there'd be no hope. But here we're making choices. We're probably not making them all that wisely, but we have some wisdom, we have some discernment. It's just a matter of applying it, giving it a foundation here in the present moment, and then really using it to look carefully. Where are you creating unnecessary stress and suffering for yourself? What can you do to change? When the mind is well settled like this, well centered, and has a sense of well-being, that sense of well-being is important. If you sit here and criticize yourself when you're feeling down in yourself, that doesn't help. But when the mind feels at ease, has a sense of fullness, well-being here in the present moment, 
then you can bring up the fact, ah, oh, you've got some habits here that are not all that skillful. Let's do something about them. The mind is a lot more willing to listen and to work on it. So these are our basic skills. These are our basic components that we break things down into so we can understand how to put them together in a better way. So things that we tend to cling to and habits we have of doing over and over again that are leading to suffering stress, we can take them apart and then we can put everything back together in a better way that turns into a path. That unlike our normal life doesn't just keep going around and around and around, it actually goes someplace, someplace that's really worth going. Now here again, this is where conviction is important. The state that the Buddha described as health, nirvana, is something he can't pull out and just show to us. On the one end, we have to take his word for it. And the kind of commitment he asks for, on the one hand, he doesn't have the role of being a god who can tell you what you have to do. But just say he's an expert in putting an end to suffering. That requires some conviction on our part. But it's not just a kind of floating, uncommitted conviction. You really do have to commit yourself to this. It's a path that requires an awful lot of attention and a lot of persistence, patience. Because we're working with a big problem. And it takes time sometimes to break the big problem down into manageable bits so we can understand, oh, this is why I've been doing this all along. And here's an alternative. So the path does ask a lot, but on the other hand, it offers a lot as well. And you think of the alternative, just continuing to keep on suffering in your old ways. It makes sense to give this path a serious try, a sincere try. 